Well, glory to God. We're so glad you're here this morning and worshiping the Lord. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord. The Bible says those of you that are watching with us online as well, we welcome you today to our series. We began a grace series. Uh, this is part two. Today we're going to talk about uh, our new identity and the new desires that God has placed in our hearts. Grace is so important for you to understand. It is such an important part of biblical teaching that if you don't understand it, I think we end up missing a lot of what God has provided for us to live the Christian life. I want to read to you a scripture um, I don't have uh, in my notes here today, but I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As I got up this morning, the Lord reminded me of, of this two scriptures I want to read uh, first before we get started uh, in our message today. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8, the Apostle Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. God provides grace for an abundance of good works. Everybody say grace. And he says God is able to make all grace abound toward you. So God is in giving, in the giving grace business. And then in the first... uh, a chapter of 1 Corinthians, if you'll go back one book there in the Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, he writes this, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. I thank God always for you for the grace of God which was given to you in Christ Jesus. You know what? As I read that scripture, I began to pray for you, for Grace Point Fellowship members and people that attend our church. And I said, Lord, I thank you for the grace that you have provided for all of, you, of your people here at Grace Point Fellowship that you have given to them in Christ Jesus. And how many of you are glad you have grace from God? I am so glad that I have grace from God. And so I thank the Lord for that. So, Father, today as we get started in your word, I thank you for clarifying for us, Lord, perhaps some things that have been uh, questions in our minds uh, concerning this important subject of grace I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us through Christ. As we sang this morning, Lord, you bore the cross, you bore our shame so that we could know you, so that we could have a new life in Christ. And I thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Open eyes and ears to see and to hear, Father God, the truth of your word in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Now, in Galatians chapter 3, last week we read uh, from Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. I want to just kind of go back there again. Uh, Paul is writing to the Galatian churches, and he said, Oh, foolish Galatians, they were being tempted to go back to the law, uh, uh, to to return back to a law-based kind of living. Uh, And so Paul writes and says, You're foolish who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit? That is the Spirit of God. By the works of the law, did you receive the Spirit? Did you receive empowerment from God because you kept laws? He said, or by hearing of faith, or because you heard the gospel and you responded to the truth of God by faith. Well, obviously, it is the faith because he's talking about the justification by faith. Then he says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect? By the flesh. He asks that question uh, of the Galatian Christians. And today, by extension to us, do we begin by the Spirit's power? Do we begin by the Spirit's work? Do we begin by the grace that God saves us with and then perfect ourselves by the power of the flesh? Paul says that is foolish. Are you foolish? I told you last week the the Greek there is stronger. It's really uh, the word from which we get the word idiot. Uh, in the English language, right? You're, you're idiots to think that you can perfect what God has begun in you by the power of His Spirit. So the Christian life is lived, or is begun, I should say, by the grace of God, by the Holy Spirit who brings life, and it is empowered and continued by this same grace. A lot of Christians today don't know how to live the Christian life, and they're frustrated because they're trying by the power of their own flesh and their own, uh, you know, will to live the way that God called us to live. 
And, uh, and so it is foolish, Paul says, to begin by the grace of God and continue any other way. And we said last week that if we belittle the grace, we talked about how Paul talked about grace being uh, a hyper grace. In other words, excessive grace, abundant grace, overflowing grace. Uh, and we said that if we belittle the grace of God, we really belittle the ability to be victorious over sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 14, we also read this last week, Paul says, for sin shall not have dominion over you. How many of you think that's a good thing, right? That I'm not overcome by sin, but that I can live my life pleasing to God. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Listen, here's the key. Because you're not under law, but under grace, all right? And we're going to kind of... Uh, Unpack that a little bit today. You're not under law. You're not, you're, you're not called to keep laws by your own ability to try to see if you can please God in some fashion or if God will accept you by what you do. He says, but you're under grace. And we said that grace is God's unmerited favor given to sinners just because he chooses to do that. Now, grace is empowering against sin, and you can never really win the battle against sin in the power of the flesh. This is what Paul is, uh, Paul's whole point in, uh, in bringing those questions up that we just read. Grace, the grace of God, is so valuable that what we don't know, we said last week, about grace can hinder us from experiencing victory over sin. If you think that it depends on you to live by your own power to, to, to overcome sin... Uh, you're going to live a very frustrated Christian life. You're going to be, you know, frustrated. You're going to, you're going to be upset at yourself. You're going to be, you know, uh, all, all kinds of, of maladies that spring up in a Christian's life when he tries to live by the power of flesh. No victory over sin. You never feel like you're ever victorious. You're always falling, you know, uh, into sin. Uh, you never have the peace that Christ promised would be yours. You don't, you can't, you don't live your life for the Lord with joy because you have, uh, trying to manage sin in your life. And ultimately, you don't have the peace or the hope that comes from enjoying Jesus in every uh, area of your life. You know, Pastor Ronnie was talking about that some time back. You know, you just get in the Word, you spend time with the Lord, you enjoy your presence or the presence of the Lord in your life. It is not just coming to church. It is an enjoyment of a relationship that God created for His pleasure and for you to understand it. Now, we said that last week, some people, you know, talk about grace. We talk about grace, grace, grace. You shouldn't talk so much about grace, pastor, because it's dangerous. And I said to you that grace isn't dangerous to believers. It's dangerous to the devil. Come on. The devil doesn't want you to have peace. He doesn't want you to have victory over sin. He doesn't want you to enjoy the joy that comes by manifesting Jesus in your life. He doesn't want you to have the hope that you can live in a way that is pleasing to God and so he is going to belittle grace. He's going to obviously attack it in any way that he can. And, you know, people all the time will say, you know, well, uh, Pastor, if I believe in this grace, this, this uh, hyper element of grace that Paul talks about being in excess, overflowing, what is the incentive, right, to a believer to not, you know, just kind of lay around and drink and watch porn and smoke marijuana all day? So my question to people who have those kind of questions is, is that what you want to do? Well, no, I'm not talking about me, but I'm talking about others. And so they're afraid for others. So I like to tell people, so, so you don't need an incentive, right? You just told me that you don't want to do those things. You don't want to, you know, spend all your days, you know, laying in front of TV, drinking alcohol and smoking dope. Well, no, I don't want to do that. All right, so you don't need an incentive to do the things that please God. You're afraid that other believers might not do that. And so sometimes Christians who object to grace and abundant grace, they're too afraid of too much grace, not for themselves again, but for other people. They're not going to have an incentive to really go out and serve the Lord. And they're going to go out and do whatever they want. So my question is, you're not doing what you want? As a Christian, you're not doing what you want? What do you want to do? You want to drink alcohol all day and smoke dope and watch porn? 
No, I don't want to do that. Okay, so you're doing what you want. You see, the devil very astutely tries to get us to believe that if you believe that grace ought to be abundant and overflowing in your life because God decided to do that, not so that you could have an excuse or a license to sin. I told you last week, you don't need a license to sin. You don't come to me, Pastor, can I sin? (laughs) No, you just do it, right? So as we talk about grace, we need to understand this. Grace is only dangerous to the devil. Because if you're a child of God and you have been saved and you have been transformed and you have a new heart, you're doing what you want to do. How many of you wanted to come to church this morning? I see some of you didn't raise your hands. That's okay. I don't know why you're here, but he said, I'm here because I wanted to be here. So you're doing what you want. And oftentimes Christians try to be afraid for other believers. You know, they're scared about what Christians want. If you preach to them as great pastor, you know, people are going to feel like they have a license. Or they need a license or an excuse to sin. But you know what? I found that God isn't afraid of what his children want. I repeat that again. God isn't afraid of what his children, what believers want. Do you know why? Go to Romans chapter 6 with me for a moment. And I'll tell you why. Paul writes about it right here in Romans chapter 6. See, Christians, well, pastor, you preach so much grace and, and, and you know, people are going to get the wrong idea. Well, God, God isn't afraid of that. That's why he gave you excessive grace. He gave you overflowing grace. He gave you abundant grace. Notice we read over there that God gives us grace so that we can have an abundance for all things, all the time. God did that. Why isn't God afraid of what his children may want? Paul says in Romans 6, verse 17, But God, be thanked that you were slaves of sin. Now, what tense is that? Past, right? You were slaves. And Paul's talking to Christians now. He said to the children of God, you were slaves of what? Sin. You couldn't help doing that. You know why? Because that's what you wanted to do. Because you were enslaved to sin. This is the condition of every person without Christ. But he says to them, yet you obeyed from the heart, from the spirit, right? Your real person inside. He said, from the heart, the form of doctrine or teaching to which you were delivered. Verse 18, I speak in human terms, he said, because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness, And of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now, now that you're no longer the slaves of sin, he says, so now present your members as slaves of what? Righteousness for holiness. So in other words, now you have the capacity, because you're no longer a slave of sin, you are now, he says in verse 18, a slave of righteousness. Go back to verse 18. I think we skipped that. And being set free from sin... Who set us free from sin? Jesus. Remember, we began with the Spirit. The Spirit of God came, forgave, and empowered us to live. And he says, now you've been set free from sin. And you became something. What did you become? People don't like the word slave. The word word slave is also the word that's, that's translated servant in the Bible. So servant sounds a little bit better for you. It's okay. But see, Paul lived during the time of slavery. People were slaves. They had no rights. They, had, they were in bondage. They had to do what they were told. So Paul says, you were slaves and sin was your master. But now, he says, you've been set free from that master. Why? Because now you're a slave of a different sort. Now your bondage is to righteousness. Your slavery is to do what's right. That's why God isn't afraid of his children and what they want, because his children want to do what's right. 
See, God can afford to put you under grace with no limits because His grace didn't stop just at forgiveness. God's grace didn't just bring forgiveness into your life. God's grace also gives you new spiritual passions and new spiritual desires. Let me show that to you in Ephesians chapter 2. This is, again, Paul telling us where we came from, where we were, those of us who are Christians, who are followers of Christ. Now, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're still there, by the way. If you haven't been saved by, by Christ, if you're not a follower of Christ, you're still there. You, he made alive who were dead. You're spiritually dead. Now, what, would you de- what were you dead in? Trespasses and sins. You were dead in sin. Now, get that phrase. Hold it there for a moment. You were dead. This is where you were. You were dead in sin. Now, where are you now if you're in Christ? Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 9. Paul says, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, he dies no more. Death no longer has what? Dominion over him. Why? He has defeated death. This is the whole Central core of the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He rose from the dead. He defeated death. Folks, the gospel isn't just a good story. The gospel is the reality of what Christ has done in our life, in our existence, and what he has prepared for the future. Nobody in human history has ever defeated death, never to die again. Now, there are people who have clinically died and have come back to life, but they died eventually again. Christ defeated death. He died and he rose again, never to die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. And then in verse 11, he says, Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin. Notice, we were dead in sin. We were prisoners of uh, 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 bondage to sin. But now, he says... This is a different death, the death to sin. Why? Because Christ died for sin. He died our sin. He died for our sin. He died in our place. So likewise, he said, now as a result of being united to Christ, you reckon yourself to be dead to sin. That's kind of like how we talk in Texas, right? I reckon. So it it just means take it as a fact. Reckon it as so. This is the spiritual reality that Christ brought to us when he rose from the dead. And those of us who believe in him, he says, now you reckon yourself to be dead to sin. Why? Because that's what Christ died to. Died to sin so that he could live for God. And then he says, now you're to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. So before we were dead in sin, now we are dead to sin. But now we are to live for God in Christ. Now, think about that because that's a truth that ought to affect your life and my life as believers. So as a believer, you're now to be allergic to sin, but you are to be addicted to Jesus. Now, listen to me carefully. You may want, or you may think, I should say, that you want to sin, You may feel sometimes like you want to sin, but you are going to prove your new identity that Christ has given you by grace. If any man be in Christ, he is a what? A new creature. That's your new identity, right? You are now a servant of righteousness. That's your new identity. You're no longer a slave of sin. You're dead to sin. But you may think that you want to sin, you may feel like you want to sin, but you're going to prove, listen, your new identity, if you're a Christian, in one way or another, by sinning and being miserable, or by expressing Jesus in obedience and being fulfilled as a Christian with victory over sin. What am I saying? That if you're a Christian, you've been saved by grace, Your new identity is going to be shown in one of two ways. One, by victory over sin because you obey the Lord and you do what God designed you to do. Or two, you're going to sin against God. And as Christians, we're not immune to sin. Sometimes we do sin. 
But if you're a Christian, you're going to sin and you're going to be miserable in your sin. You say, Pastor, well, I sin and I don't feel miserable. That's because you're not saved. <laughs> what do you mean? Because servants of righteousness are slaves to righteousness. That means that you are compelled as a servant of righteousness to do what is right. So when you don't do what is right, you feel miserable. And you, those of us who are Christians, you know what I'm talking about. You've done wrong and, and you, you're still proud. You know, you know, you said something to someone and you, something inside told you you shouldn't have said that. You were wrong. And you... Mm, mm. And the Holy Spirit says, you need to repent of that. And you offer all kinds of excuses. Yes, Lord, but you know they did and said. And, and you still feel miserable. And even if you should... Be able to make yourself feel happy. As you go through the day, the Holy Spirit will bring back again. And you're like, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said it that way. I shouldn't have been that mean. I shouldn't have been that unkind. I shouldn't. Why? Because God has given you new desires, new passions. He has made you a servant of what is right. And that's why I say God is not afraid of what his children want. That's why he has given them grace and empowered them to live the way that honors him. And that's why I said, Pastor, if you preach too much grace, aren't people going to use it as a license? I said, well, is that what you want to do? No, I don't want to do that, but somebody else might. Well, if you don't want to do that, you're a child of God. No child of God wants to do what is unrighteous. They may feel like they want to, they may think that they might want to do that, but they don't want to do that because they're born of God. Because God has given them something that has empowered them to be able to do what pleases Him. Now, this idea of grace, as I said, sometimes people belittle grace because their idea of grace is so puny. It's, it, it's really not the grace that God talks about. But this new identity that God has given us proves itself by how we live, whether we're in obedience and we receive victory over sin, joy, peace, all of the things as we walk with the Lord, or in disobedience and we receive conviction. and We feel miserable when we've disobeyed the Lord because we are now no longer slaves of sin. See, I didn't have to do that. I could have done what was right and honoring to God. So you're a servant of righteousness. That's your new identity. In Romans chapter 6 verse 18, Paul says this, and having been set free from sin again, you became what? Servants or slaves of righteousness. See, when Jesus set you free, if you, if the Son, Jesus said, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. If you came to Christ, He set you free from sin. Sin is no longer your master. That's why you don't want to do that. You may do it. You may feel like you want to, but you don't really want to do that because now you are a servant of righteousness. Can you say amen? Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, look, look, look at what Paul writes here. Let's go over there real quick. Always caring about, Paul says, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus. All right, Jesus died. He died. He didn't die for himself. He died for us, didn't he? So the death of Christ, he said, we carry it about. In other words, we are always conscious of the fact that Christ died for me. I've been purchased by him with his blood. He says, we carry about in, the, the, in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might also be manifested in our body. How many of you think the life of Jesus is good to manifest in your body? Eh? Amen? Yeah. That Jesus, everything that Jesus represents, that I would live that way. He said the life of Jesus is manifested as we live or carry about the death or the dying of Jesus. Jesus died to the world. We're dead to the world. Jesus had victory over sin. We have victory and can have victory over sin. And I carry the life of Jesus manifested, Paul says, in our body. Verse 11, for we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might also be manifested in our mortal flesh. So again, 
We are delivered to death. What does that mean? Well, that's more than just physically dying for Jesus. Paul Paul is talking here also about we are delivered to a life of death. In other words, we have died to sin. And every time you're tempted to sin, you're reminded you're dead to sin. You don't have to do that. You don't have to respond that way. And when you obey, when you become that servant of righteousness or you act in line with that, you what? You manifest the life of Jesus. You say, I want more of Jesus in my life. Well, you need to live the death of Jesus. Carry it around in your body. Remind yourself, Jesus died to this. I am to reckon myself to be dead to this sin. Whatever that sin is in your life, whatever that major thing, problem that you have in your life, reckon it to be dead so that the life of Jesus, he said, might be manifest in your mortal body. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 and 17, and I quoted this earlier for you. He says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, how many today we have in Christ here? If you're in Christ, he said, you're a new creation. Notice he is not going to be a new creation. He what? Is a new creation. Right? It is a fact. It is a spiritual reality. All things have passed away. See, I was a slave of sin. It is, that's passed away. I am now a slave of righteousness. And he says, all things have become new. God has given us a new identity. We are new creatures in Christ. We are the servants of righteousness. So you see, if you're a true believer, for all true believers in Christ, sin is always a shock to your system. It ought to be. If it's not, I said, like I said, you may want to examine yourself whether you are really in the faith. Because as servants of righteousness, you are fused to Jesus. You are bonded to Him forever. You belong to Him. You cannot get away from your core desires. Now listen to me. You cannot get away from the core desires that God has given to you when He gave you a new heart. That is why I said that as a Christian, you can do what you want. And, Christ, and sometimes people don't understand it. Well, pastor, that's giving them a license to do, you know, to sin. Is that what you want? No. Okay. So you are going to do what you want. And what you want is to be a servant of righteousness. So you talk to people who want to, to grow in the Lord. What do you want? I want to know the Lord better. I want to be able to meditate the scripture more. I want to, I want to be able to, to, to pray better. I want to be able to, you know, to live my life in an honor to, honoring the Lord better. I, that's what you want. That's your core desire. That is the proof, the evidence of the Spirit of God inside of you that you are a Christian. If you don't have that, folks, you need to examine yourself before God. You might just be religious. You say, but I come to church every Sunday. So did the little bird here that was flying around. I don't know where he went. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. So just because you're in church doesn't mean that your desire, your core desire, that you're saved. You see that you come to the Lord and repent of your sins and recognize he's the only one that can save me. But when you come to Christ, the core desires are there. You cannot get away from them. Now, when people are worried about too much grace, as I said, our our view of grace becomes puny, pitiful, because you have to understand grace is more than mercy when you fail. It is available to you in forgiveness. But grace is more than your ticket to heaven and out of hell. Grace is more than your sin debt being canceled. God has given you new desires, a new heart, a new spirit. Look at with me in Ezekiel chapter 11. God took a spiritual scalpel. You know what doctors use to open up, you know, your chest when they're going to operate on you? Very sharp knife. God took a spiritual uh, scalpel and gave you a heart transplant if you're a Christian. This is what makes you a Christian. Without this, you're just a religious person. There's a lot of those in the world today. 
God said this, listen, then God says to his people of old, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. Who's going to do that? God is. Now notice what God is going to do. God said, I'm going to give them one heart. I'm going to put a new spirit within them. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take the stony heart out of their flesh and I'm going to give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20. Now why is God going to do that? He says that they may walk, that they may live, that they may do what? My statutes, keep my judgments and do them. Question, how do you walk in God's statutes? How do you keep his judgments and how do you do his commands? Somebody said, well, we just have to discipline ourselves and try harder. No. You don't begin in the spirit. And perfect in the flesh. Christian life isn't you trying to be a Christian. If you're trying, you got the wrong thing. If it's if you think it depends on you, you got the wrong thing. What you need is grace. And God, that's why God says, I will do this. I will put a new heart in you. I'm going to take your old heart of flesh. I am going to put a new spirit within you. Why? So that you may walk in my statutes. See, you cannot walk, keep the commandments of God, walk in his judgments, do the things that please God, unless you've gotten that new heart. And only God can do that. That's why Jesus said you must be born again. Born from above. Not of the will of the flesh or the will of man or of blood, but of God. God does a sovereign work in salvation that nothing, no religious experience, nothing can do. And that's why I tell people, churches don't save you. This church can't save you. The Catholic church doesn't save you. The Mormon church doesn't save you. The Baptist church doesn't save you. Christ saves you. And he does it by imparting to you a new heart, a new spirit. Listen, when God gives you a new desire, going to give you new uh, 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 passions for Jesus, new desires of the heart, it's because he has given you a new heart. You don't have the old heart anymore when you're a Christian. And he does it so that you may what? Obey him. So that you may walk in his statutes. You can't walk without a new heart. You can't keep the commandments without a new heart. That's why Paul said, if we began in the spirit, do we now perfect by the flesh? Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? The works that you tried to keep in the law, did you get that from God? He said, no, are you foolish? This can't be done that way. But when God, by grace, gives you a new heart, when you come to him and you repent of your sins, that God is, listen, by the Holy Spirit, he regenerates you, he gives you a new birth. Now you may walk in his statutes. You keep his judgment. You can do them. And then he says what? Then you'll be my people and I will be your God. This is how you know you're a Christian. And that's why I said if you're a Christian, you, do, you can do what you want. God is not afraid to give you grace to empower you to do what you want. Because this is what you want if you're a Christian. You see the question that I posed at the beginning. Well, what is the incentive to not lay around and drink beer and smoke dope all day, Pastor, if you just talk about grace. Because grace gives you a new heart. Grace gives you new desires. And when you have those desires, you become a servant, not of sin anymore, not a slave of sin, but a servant of righteousness. I want to do what's right. So if I ask you today as a Christian, you tell me I'm a Christian, to say, well, what do you want to do? None of you would tell me, well, I want to sin. Right? I want to sin. No, you may think you want to. You may feel like you want to. But your wanter is to do what is right. That's why I said you're going to prove your identity one way or another. When you sin, you're going to be miserable if you're a Christian. That proves that you are a Christian. It makes you miserable. You are convicted. The world doesn't live that way. The world lives and gives rain to sin. Let it fly, man. That's why you see the world and you see it declining more and more. And you look at people and you think, how in the world can people live like that? Because that's what they want. God just lets them do what they want. Their sinful nature is to 
go to the depth of sin if they can, and deeper. But a Christian, the moment you step out of line with God's word and you begin to sin, the Holy Spirit convicts you. There is a, there's a heaviness, there is a misery that comes. Because sin, that's all sin will give you, folks, is misery. God delivered you from that which was killing you and sending you to hell. <laughs> thank God. I thank the Lord for grace every day. I say, God, thank you to give me more than I deserve. But grace is more than just forgiveness. More than just a get-out-of-jail-free card. More than a get-out-of-hell, you know, escape hell. Grace is more than that. It is spiritual power. It would say power. It is an empowerment by God to live for God and be pleasing to Him. It's getting a new heart for free card. <laughs> so forgiveness and empowerment to live above sin's dominion are both things that we should celebrate. We should be thankful to God for grace that saved us and forgave us. When we were dead in sin, when we were walking according to the prince of the power of the air. But God, Paul said, who is rich in mercy, by grace he saved us and gave us a new identity. Grace gives us new desires. So because of that, you have every reason, I have every reason to push the accelerator on grace all the way to the floor. Paul says, overflowing, abundant, in excess. We talked about that last week. Because when the sky is the limit, folks, when freedom is the, to, the, to the sky, what is it that you really want? And as I said to you, have you ever noticed that whenever you're, if you're a child of God, when you sin, it never pays off, does it? Because sin is really the best way, if you're a Christian, to be miserable. If you're a Christian. So without understanding, or having a good understanding, I should say, of the gospel, grace can sometimes feel a little hazy, a little nebulous, a little misty. You know, we say things like, God is good. And that's true. But what do we mean by that? What do we mean when we say, you know, God is gracious? Because the grace of God, the gospel of God, is very specific in identifying grace to you. God is good. God is great. Well, you know, Muslims say that. And then they'll blow people up. <laughs> so, that's not specific. What do we mean when we say God is good? God is gracious? Well, the gospel defines grace for us with really pinpoint accuracy. Because you no longer have to worry. I no longer have to wonder how forgiven am I? How secure am I? How new has God really made me? Will I, will I ever make heaven? How forgiven are you? Well, Paul, excuse me, Peter writes here in Acts chapter 13. Look at uh, verse 39. He says this. By him, that is by Jesus, everyone who believes is justified from all things. How many things? How many of you are glad God forgot a lot of your sins? How many of you are glad he forgot all of them? In him or by him, everyone who believes this justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. How forgiven are you? You're forgiven and justified from all things. Somebody said, well, Pastor, man, you, you don't know what I did. Well, I don't want to know. <laughs> but you know what? Christ knows. And when you came to him, he forgave you of them all. I'm so glad for that. How secure are you? Go to John chapter 10, verse 27 through 29. See, the gospel again pinpoints grace. It identifies it. It makes it 
identifiable. Not just God is good, but why is God good? Well, God is good because he has forgiven everything in my life. See, it's specific. How secure are you? Well, look, look what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice. He's talking about those who are his followers. My sheep hear my voice. Now, notice he didn't say my sheep might hear my voice. Because I don't know. Sometimes I have some sheep that just, they just don't hear. Well, do some sheep of the Lord not hear his voice sometimes? Yes. But do they want not to hear his voice? No. I want God to speak to me. I don't always hear him and I don't always obey him when he does. But my desire is to hear him. Why? Because he's given me a new heart, new desires. So Jesus doesn't say, my sheep have the ability to hear my voice. My sheep, will, maybe, hopefully, they will hear my voice. No, he knows. You're my sheep, you'll hear my voice. And then he says, and I know them. Now, how many of you know that the Lord knows who everybody is? He doesn't say, I know who they are. No, he says, I know them. I have a relationship with him. The word no, again, again, I bring out, it's like Adam knew his wife and they bore a child. It is that intimacy of relationship, of knowing. God knows us intimately. He has a relationship with us. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. I have an intimate relationship with him. And because I do, they follow me. Now, Come on, Jesus. You know, sometimes your, your sheep, they, don't, they just want to go over there. Yeah. But eventually they will follow me. Why? Because they're my sheep. Because that's how it comes about, having received a new heart, that's how they do it. Now, you know, most of us, we know uh, an autopilot. You know, if, if you fly a plane, there's an autopilot, right? Autopilot means you put it on autopilot and you get up from your seat and do something else. You ever been in a boat? Uh, uh, you know, that uh, a boat that has an autopilot, you, you put the autopilot and you say it goes in this direction, maybe you're going east, and you fix it. And you can get up from there, you can get, let, let go of the steering wheel, you can walk back, and the boat will what? It'll go to in that direction because that's what it's set for. Now, you can get over there and not take the auto, auto uh, you know, control off and take a hold of the wheel and turn it. And you can turn that ship or that boat around to go in the opposite direction. But the moment that you let go, what happens to that ship? Why? Because it is programmed in that direction. That's what God did when he gave you a new heart. That's why he's not afraid to give you grace in abundance. Because it is grace that empowers you to live the way God designed you to live. That's why Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And listen to what he does. Verse 28. And I give them what? Eternal life. And, and, and I'm hoping that they'll make it to heaven. That's the, oh no, that's, that's the Rodriguez version. That's not the Bible, right? No, no. They shall never what? Perish. Well, why does, how does Jesus know that? I mean, you know, maybe they could. No, he says, no, because they're my sheep. My father gave them to me. And he said, I give them eternal life. In other words, I equip them to walk with me, to know me, to hear my voice. They will never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. And then in verse 29, he says, and my father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So no one can snatch you out of Jesus' hand. No one can snatch you out of my Father's hand, Jesus said. So you are secure. How secure are, are you? The gospel says, you, if you're a Christian, you will never perish. I know sometimes people say, hey, no, but, Pastor, but you know, we can. And, and you know, again, grace in abundance. God had to do it by grace because had he did it, Listen, had he done salvation by works, we'd all be lost. <laughs> I mean, 
We know that experientially. We know that intuitively. I always tell God, dear God, don't leave me alone. God, don't let me do what I want to do. I think I want to do. Let me do what you have placed in my heart to do. Because that's my real desire. New desires. And those new desires are what keep us moving in the right direction. How secure are you? You'll never perish if you belong to Christ. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. How new are you? Well, the gospel tells us very directly that you are a new creation. We read that earlier. You're a new creation in Christ. All things are new in you. And aren't you glad for that? So grace is this dynamic force, as I said, that works in your life to make you into what God called you to be. I want to follow the Lord. Well, He gave you a new heart to do that. I want to do what's right before the Lord. I want to honor the Lord. Well, He made you a servant of righteousness. You didn't make yourself that. You were a slave of sin. He made you a servant, a slave of righteousness. He fixed your core. He gave you new desires by giving you a new heart so that you could walk in His ways and keep His commandments and do the things that please Him. This is grace, folks. Grace empowers you. But you know what else grace does? Titus 2, verse 11 and 12 tells us that the grace of God that brings this salvation that we're talking about, he said, has appeared to all men. And then he says this, teaching us. How many of you knew that the grace of God taught you something? You see, the grace of God teaches us. The grace of God that God has poured into your life is a teacher. It teaches you. So you need to learn, what does grace do for me? That's what the Bible says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. Since grace teaches us that denying ungodliness, worldly lusts, what are we to do? Deny. Now, it isn't, now, 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 he's not saying here you deny that ungodliness exists or deny that worldly lusts exist. No, those things are real. But he says you deny ungodliness. You deny worldly lust. You deny living an ungodly life. You deny live, living a worldly life. How do you do that? By going around all the time saying, I deny that, I deny that, I, I, I don't want to do that. I want. No. You deny ungodliness in your life by living godly. Notice what he says. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So how do you deny ungodliness? Do what you want. What do you want? I want to be like the Lord. Then live that way. And the moment you're presented with an ungodly thing, you deny it how? By living godly. The moment you're challenged with uh, worldly lust, a worldly lust means that simply a desire that the world has. Like the world wants to live that way. Well, I don't want to live that way. That's not me. So living who you are, doing what God has empowered you to do by grace is the way that you live and, or you deny ungodliness and you deny worldly lust. And again, people will get into the works mode and the law mode and, and they'll try, I'm, I'm not going to be ungodly. I'm not going to, and they end up falling into it. Because I told you, living live the Christian life by the power of the flesh is like falling in quicksand and trying your best to save yourself. And the more you struggle in quicksand, what happens? The more you sink. And the more you slap around. That's why they tell you when you fall in quicksand, you should try to lay on your back. Quit struggling because you're going to die. Unless there's somebody around there to pull you out. Because the more you try, the more, you, see, is it like the Christian, the more effort, I, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show God, man, I'm, I'm, I can be godly. Even. <laughs> and the more ungodly you start to live. The more you try in the power of your own flesh, because you weren't designed to live, you are dead to sin. Struggling against it is not going to do anything. It is yielding to the grace that God has already provided for you. You deny ungodliness. You deny 
uh, worldly lusts by living soberly, righteously, and godly, he said. So that's what saying no to sin means. I say yes to Jesus and Christ inside of me. So see, the gospel, again, pinpoints grace very, very uh, directly. Grace empowers us to be righteous. We can do what's right because we have a new heart. Grace gives us a new life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The grace, the gospel of Christ that we find the grace of God gives us new desires. So we need to lay aside law-based living so that we can trust grace all the way. You know, the early church kind of faced this as the Jewish, you know, people, they were covenant people of God in the Old Testament. And they saw anybody who wasn't Jewish, anybody who was outside the Jews kind of like, they were outside the covenant, they didn't know God, they, they were dogs. Uh, but the Bible says that the gospel is not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. So in Acts chapter 15, go over there for a moment real quick. In Acts chapter 15, verse 4, there is a uh, situation that came up in the early church. And that was that, you know, the, the church began as a Jewish uh, church, and then they started reaching Gentiles. And you remember, Jews and Gentiles, they didn't get along too well. The Jews despised the Gentiles. Anybody who wasn't Jewish was you know, anathema. So when G Gentiles started responding to the gospel, all of a sudden they were like, wow, these Gentiles now are coming to join themselves with Jewish believers to form the church, and, and what are we supposed to do? In Acts chapter 15, they uh, came to, together, the apostles and the leaders of the church, to think about and kind of uh, talk out this problem. And it says in verse 4, when they came to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up. So here's some Pharisees. They, they're believers there in Jesus. They rise up and they said it is necessary to circumcise them, that is the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And remember the the Jewish uh, people, they followed the command of the law to circumcise their children on the eighth day. The Gentiles didn't do that. So when they came in, the, the Jews said, well, I think we should, you know, require them if they're going to be Christians. They're going to be, you know, part of the church that they circumcise their, their males and that they keep the law of Moses. Now, that doesn't sound bad, does it? Right? I mean, the law was the law of God, the law of Moses. You ought to keep the law. Keep the law of Moses. And it's interesting that the apostles took a different view. Not because they didn't believe in the law. Don't misunderstand. Not because there was anything wrong with the law. It was the wrong way to keep the law. On the power of your own flesh, you're going to try to keep the, perfect, the law of perfection? Are you kidding me? And so they said, we need to command them that they do these things. Verse 6, the apostles came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, in other words, back and forth, Peter rose up and said, men and brethren, listen to what he said, you know that a good while ago God chose me among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. God who knows the heart, listen, he accepted them. He acknowledged these Gentiles who, who didn't even have the law. They weren't even circumcised. And God gave them the Holy Spirit just like he did to us. Isn't that strange? And he says, but he made no distinction between us and them, us who are Jews, us who have the law, the covenants, and the blood. He didn't make any distinction between us and them. He purified their hearts. How? By faith. In other words, by faith in Christ. That's what he's talking about. He purified Gentiles' heart, and they didn't keep the law. And all of a sudden, the Jews are like, what? what, what, what? No, man, you got to be circumcised. you got to keep the law. you got to have a medical procedure. <laughs> That's what circumcision is. you got to have a medical procedure. Imagine if I said, in order for you to be a Christian and join this church, you got to go to the hospital and have a medical procedure done. How many of you would come back? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not going back. <laughs> they said, No. God purified their hearts by faith. Verse 11. Now, therefore, why do you test God? Now, Peter says, why are you testing God? To put a yoke, listen to what he says, on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we 
or able to bear. Why are you trying to put requirements on them, Peter says, that, guys, we couldn't keep? That's called setting them up for failure. Peter himself, an apostle, a Jew who lived under the law, said, we, we couldn't even keep it. We want them to keep it. Why are you testing God? Why are you putting a yoke? And this is what people do. Listen, if you want to be a Christian, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. You've got to read the Bible and you've got to pray. How many of you believe Christians should read the Bible? How many of you believe Christians should pray? How many of you believe people should support the work of God? How many of you believe people should pray? The Pharisees believed all that. And you ought to do those things, but you don't do those things to be saved. You do those things because you are saved. And that's why I've always told you, obedience is not the requirement for salvation. Obedience is the fruit of salvation. So that you may walk in my commandments and do them. Why are you wanting to test God? He says, you're putting a yoke that they can't bear. Verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. What did it take? Grace. We are saved by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Forget about circumcision. That's not what God was really after. Forget about, listen, the works of the law and keeping commandments. He said, forget about that. That's not what it's about. You know why? Hebrews chapter 7, go over there, verse 18. We're told here in the NIV, I want to read this in the NIV. Hebrews 7, verse 18, listen. The former regulation, talking about the law here, is set aside. Is what? It's talking about the law. The former regulations, the regulations that were in the law, are what? Set aside. Well, who set them aside? Well, the Lord did. Now, why did he do that? Because it was weak and useless. Now, don't misunderstand. He's not talking about the law being useless. The law had a purpose. But it wasn't the purpose that the Jews thought it had. See, some people go to the Bible and think, well, if I just obey this and this and this and I'll, I'll, I'll be okay, I'll get into heaven. If I do this and this, it, it, you know, I'll show God and I'll, I'll, I'll be acceptable to God. All the regulations that you find in the Scripture, all the commandments, all the laws, he said, God set them aside because it was weak. Weak what? Paul said, it wasn't the law that was the problem, it was the weakness in man. It was the sin in man. There's nothing wrong with the law. The, whole, the law, he says, is holy, just, and good. It was the weakness of man. It was useless to save him. The law could not save us. Then in verse 19, he says, for the law, again, again, he's talking about the law, made nothing what? Perfect. And a better hope is introduced. Woo! You mean there's hope even without the law? <laughs> Peter said, why are you trying to put a yoke on the disciples that we couldn't even keep? God knows their heart. He purified their hearts by faith in Christ. Here's the better hope. God introduced a better hope. He set aside the commandment as a way to righteousness, and he introduced a better hope. And by that better hope, what do we do? We draw near to God. You want to draw near to God? You need the right hope. It isn't you trying to keep commandments and laws and rules. It is the better hope that God has introduced, even though he set aside the law because it couldn't perfect you. He brought in a better hope. Who is that better hope? Go back to chapter 6 in Hebrews there. One of these days we're going to go through the book of Hebrews. I mean, it, if you really want to know the, the center of the Christian life, you ought to read the book of Hebrews. We're going to go through that one of these days. Not too far in the future, I hope. Listen, Hebrews 6, verse 19. We have this hope. Same hope he mentioned over there. He's going to mention in chapter 7. God introduced a new hope. He set aside the, the regulation. And he have this hope as an anchor of the soul. If I say anchor. You see, what does an anchor do? Well, it keeps a ship from going what? 
Just being taken by the water, right? Wherever. Has no control. When you set an anchor down, it firms the location of the ship. And so he is the anchor. Jesus is the anchor of our soul. Firm and secure. Notice that this hope, this anchor of the soul, it says enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. Now let me explain to you what that means. In the Old Testament, uh, in the tabernacle, there was all kinds of different sections that were in the tabernacle that the people had to approach concerning uh, God and concerning His instructions. Nobody could go into the inner sanctuary. Nobody could go behind that, that uh, uh, curtain that, w- that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. No one could go into the Holy Holies except who? The high priest. Once a year, he would go into the Holy of Holies by God's instruction, and he had to follow the laws that God had given him, the directions to the letter, or he would die in the presence of God. And he would go in there with 12 stones upon his chest. He would wear this elaborate outfit. Those 12 stones were what? The 12 tribes of Israel. All of God's people were represented in that high priest. And he would go behind that curtain once a year, He would take blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And by doing that, he was remembering that all the sins that the people had committed were now being atoned for. It's called the day of atonement. The high priest went in there and atoned for the sins and there was a remembrance of those sins. Well, the writer of the Hebrews says, now we have this hope that goes, enters behind the the veil uh, in the inner sanctuary. Verse uh, uh, 20, he says where our forerunner, Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Jesus has entered on our behalf. Here is the hope, the new hope that God set forward by which we draw near to God. This is the hope, the anchor of the soul, the one that goes behind the curtain. He enters into the very presence of God. What? To offer his blood. Now the high priest offered the blood of an an animal, of a sacrifice. Someone had to die to pay for the sins of the people. The people didn't die, but the animals died. Their blood was taken and and put on the mercy seat, saying that sin, the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to pay for that. Well, Christ went into the Holy of Holies with his own blood, and he was the sacrifice, and he took that blood into the very presence of God, and he says, and he has become our high priest forever. There is no other medium between us and God, but Jesus Christ. And Catholics, whether they're well-intentioned, and, but they've been taught wrong, Mary is not a mediator. Jesus is the only mediator. The Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is our high priest. He went into the very presence of God to atone for our sins. And when his blood was shed on the divine mercy seat, God would not remember your sins ever again. And that's called grace, folks. And our high priest doesn't need, like the priests of old, to be replaced because he lives forever. Our hope, the new hope that God has placed by which we draw near to God is a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've responded to the Savior. I wonder if you've answered the call that goes out to the human heart to repent and believe the good news of the gospel of the grace of God. You say, Pastor, what do I need to believe? That Jesus paid your sin debt. That he died so that you could live. And he rose again to justify you from all sin in your life. And then, listen, he gave you the Holy Spirit and he poured more grace upon you. The Bible says grace upon grace. He gives more grace. He gave you grace to empower you to live fused to Jesus Christ all the days of your life. Folks, I don't know about you, but I don't want to go anywhere where Jesus isn't. I want to follow him all the days of my life. How about you? So grace empowers us to do that. Grace gives us the freedom and the liberty to live our life fully for God. And that's why Paul could say, listen, there isn't anything that binds a Christian but his love for God. 
Someone said, I can't remember who it was, but of old, a pastor of old said, love God with all your heart and do what you please. Because what you please or what will please you will be what you know will please God because you have a new heart. How many of you are grateful that God has given you a new heart? Would you stand with me today as we go to the Lord in prayer? and Thank him that he has empowered you. Don't believe the lie of the enemy because you're no longer a servant of sin. You're a servant of righteousness. God, I thank you for grace. I thank you for the grace of the cross. I thank you for the abundant grace, the excess grace, the overflowing grace that you give to your kids. That you, God, are not afraid of what we want because you have fixed our heart. You have given us a new heart, a new desire, a new identity. We are the servants of righteousness. We have in our heart to do what is right and pleasing and honorable in your sight. God, if we've done anything else, forgive us. We know that the convicting power of the Holy Spirit is there to remind us that this is not who we are. We are no longer servants of sin. We are no longer the slaves of sin. We are now the servants, the slaves of righteousness. But I pray, Father, if there are people here today or watching us online today that are still bound by sin, they haven't been able to gain victory over it. Lord, I pray that they will turn with all their heart to you. That right now, Lord, as they call out to you, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. Lord, I repent of my sins. I acknowledge my sin before you. God, I need your power and your grace. And Lord, today I thank you for your people grasping the truth and the revelation, God, that you have empowered them through grace. You said, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you so that you may walk in my statutes and you may obey my commands. And Lord, I thank you that every time we obey, we ought to be grateful. Lord, I couldn't do this if you had not been merciful and gracious to me. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord. Help me to live in the way, God, that you designed me to live. To say no to ungodliness and worldly desires by living the life that you equipped me to live. God, forgive me. Strengthen me against all attacks of the enemy. Against all the calls of the world, God. And all the desires that the world would present before me. God, I thank you that I can obey, I can follow you all the days of my life. And Lord, thank you for the grace that you have given to me. That in all things, in all, I would have sufficiency in all things and abundance for every good work. And I thank you for empowering Grace Point Fellowship, for being a people who love you with all their heart and serve you because that's what they want to do. And I thank you, Father, for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, go with us today as we leave here. Thank you for all that you're doing and continue to do with us. In Jesus' name, amen.